Atto second quantum uncertainty dynamics and ultra fast squeeze light for quantum communication. I read the whole paper and right off the bat, I went, are they producing negative energy? When we talk about manipulating the zero point energy, we're talking about producing gravitational waves and we're talking about negative energy. Now, what is negative energy? This is the biggest part. This is the biggest revelation. I'm about to explain it to you in the simplest way. Imagine the zero point energy is an ocean, right? It's an ocean and it's in equilibrium, meaning it's very still. There's basically no waves on the surface. Maybe just a little bit of waves, like a tiny little bit of waves like this. Okay. This tiny little bit of waves. So if you were to imagine this, like a wave up and down, the part that's above, above the surface of the ocean is the positive energy. The part that's below the surface of the ocean was the negative energy aspect of it. Okay. That's the simplest way to think about it. So we're in this ocean. The ocean is very calm. It's very calm, but it can be disturbed. It can be disturbed. And when we think of a warp drive, we think of making a negative energy dip going below the surface level, right? And we use that negative energy to pull us forward. And when we think of a wormhole, we think of like turning that all the way up. We say, whoa, you're going to make like basically a pit, like Moses parting the Red Sea. You part the whole ocean, boom, now you've created a wormhole. This is why a warp drive and a wormhole are both connected through this idea of negative energy. And negative energy is just making your dip in your ocean. Okay. Now, this paper, why is this big? Why is this important? Because this paper talks about using squeezed states of light. We demonstrate control of the quantum state of light by switching between the amplitude and phase squeezing. So it turns out squeezing light in a two-dimensional form is analogous to squeezing the quantum vacuum in a three-dimensional reality. So imagine I were to do this. Imagine now we have our calm surface of our ocean. Now we disturb it. We start churning up the ether with electromagnetism. Why do we use electromagnetism? Because the zero-point energy is electromagnetic in nature. Listen carefully. Understanding if you remove matter and you remove radiation, yeah. what causes the electric fields? Like, where, what's the perturbation and what? I can't answer what causes it. I can tell you that the uncertainty principle requires it to be there. So, Desider space has only the uh, the dark energy. Or right. The, okay. It has no real photons. It has only the zero point energy. Okay, you can have an electric field without real photons. It just doesn't have any charges. It's there anyway. The field yeah, fluctuates it anyway. It doesn't need charges. The zero point energy is electromagnetic. So we churn it up. So now imagine that if we use a large amount of electromagnetism to churn up this zero point energy significantly, we actually squeeze the vacuum state. Now, what is squeezing the vacuum state equivalent to? What we're doing is we're, we're causing the waves in the ocean to get very turbulent. We cause them to get very turbulent. So now we went from a very calm ocean where we only have a little bit of negative energy to a very turbulent ocean where now we have a huge amount of positive energy and a huge amount of negative energy, the virtual photons. What are the virtual photons? The virtual photons are particle pairs, positive and negative particle pairs. That's what he's saying there, the virtual photons, positive and negative. So we're churning that up. That's what squeezing the vacuum state is doing. We need a huge amount of positive energy or mass. Why? Because if I take a huge amount of mass, it manipulates the vacuum. It creates a gravitational field around it, just like with the black hole. In fact, it's been argued recently that the black holes on the event horizon, the edges of the black holes, are causing this effect to occur. They're causing light to appear out of the vacuum because they cause the virtual particle pairs to be ripped out of 
space time. Wormholes and negative energy from the gravitationally squeezed vacuum. Minkowski signature wormhole solutions of Einstein field equations require the existence of negative energy in the vicinity of their throats. In order to make a wormhole, we ne need negative energy. In this note, we po point out that gravitational interaction automatically generates squeezed vacuum states of matter, which by their nature entail negative energy and thus provide a natural source for maintaining this class of wormholes. So they're saying that gravitational interaction, gravitational interaction automatically produces negative energy. Boom. Why is that so big? Because now we know how to get that negative energy. How do we get that negative energy? We just need a lot of positive energy. If I make a lot of positive energy here, I'm going to churn up that ether. That ether is going to churn up. And with it comes negative energy. This is the missing link. Yahtzee's in the chat indeed. Why? Because this is what Salvatore Pais, U.S. Navy engineer, has been saying. Why is it that we have to break that Schwinger limit? We have to get that huge positive energy. Because if we break the Schwinger limit, then the virtual photon pairs come ripping out of the vacuum. All of these concepts are directly connected. I was always wondering, how do we get that negative energy? How do we get that negative energy? We get it by pr producing a large amount of positive energy. And we know from Einstein's equations, E equals MC squared. Energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. This means there is an equivalence between mass and energy. That means we can we can get this gravitational force either by a huge heavy ball of mass like Jupiter, or we can get it through a huge amount of energy. Okay, get where I'm going with this? Let me. I'm going to read one more paragraph. We're going to go to the next thought process here. A key aspect of wormholes discovered has to do with the type of matter and energy needed in order to bruise the throat. It needs to violate the weak energy hypothesis. Now, the null energy condition, this is what's crazy too. This is what physics did. Listen closely. I am going to teach you more physics right now than any PhD physicist will, unless they're one of these black project engineers. What they did with the zero point energy is they basically said the surface of that ocean of energy is perfectly flat. They said there's no waves. They said there's no waves. There's nothing there. There's nothing there to interact with. They were wrong. When they renormalized the zero point energy, they basically went from saying that it's turbulent to saying that it's perfectly flat. If it's perfectly flat, then yes, you cannot get this negative energy. It's not possible. But if it's even a little bit turbulent, even a little bit, and we can amplify that turbulence, now we have positive energy and negative energy. This is where the physicists messed up. This is the mistake. This is why they think that negative energy is this exotic substance, because they incorrectly renormalize the zero point energy to make their equations easier, to make physics easier to understand. But in reality, it's not that simple. In reality, that zero point energy is, is fluctuating due to the uncertainty principle, due to quantum mechanics, due to the fact that quantum mechanics says the pendulum is never stopping. So they're saying that, oh, your pendulum has stopped. That's what their view is of the zero point energy. But quantum mechanics proves that's wrong. Quantum mechanics proves it's always moving just a little bit. And that little bit can be exploited. That can be exploited to produce negative energy. Although no form of classical matter violates this energy condition, the, the squeezed vacuum does. And moreover, the coupling of matter to gravity automatically leads to the production of squeezed vacuum states. The negative energy of the squeezed vacuum can be understood in simple terms. Consider a single mode oscillator. A single mode oscillator is just an up and down wave. That's it. That's all an oscillator is. It's oscillating back and forth, just like the pendulum. So consider the oscillator, the pendulum. Its vacuum state is represented in phase space by a circle centered at its origin. 
The squeeze vacuum state, by contrast, leads to an elliptical region. So we say, okay, if we were going to represent this zero-point energy, we could represent it as a circle. But if we squeeze it, now it becomes an ellipse. So if we take our waveforms, we take our calm waveforms and we squeeze it, now the waveform, the amplitude increases. And this gives us the additional negative energy that we need. Just like the ocean waves. That's why the ocean waves is such a good analogy. As this ellipse rotates, its periodic profile exhibits quantum fluctuations, both larger and smaller than the uniform profile characteristic of the unsqueezed vacuum state. So it's saying that now we're getting more negative energy than we could before. In field theory, the energy of the unsqueezed vacuum gets renormalized to zero. This was the mistake. There it is. It says it right there. Right there. How did physics mess up? Because they renormalized the zero point energy to zero. But it's not zero. And that's why negative energy is now possible. And even if the negative energy, even if the negative energy is this small amount, it's not nothing. And once we squeeze it, now we can get huge amounts. This, this is it. This is the secret. This is what it's all about, chat. This is what we've, this, this is putting it all together. Thus, any state, here you go. Thus, any state having lower fluctuations than the ordinary vacuum must have negative energy. Boom, baby. Oh, man, I love it. We found the secret sauce and we're not done yet. And we are not done yet. So the next level. Now that we know what negative energy is, now we know we have to squeeze the vacuum. That's what we have to do. We're exploiting quantum mechanics. Now that we know it's all about squeezing the vacuum state, how do we do it? How do we do it? Well, we just heard. We need to produce positive gravitational force. We need to produce a black hole. If we produce a black hole, then we can squeeze the vacuum. That's what the black holes are doing. Okay. Now I thought, huh. Wait a minute. What is fusion doing? Isn't isn't a fusion bomb literally doing that? Isn't it an a neutronic fusion bomb producing a high efficiency amount of electromagnetic energy? Yes it is. Yes it is. <laughs> oh, Dr. Pudoff, I'm coming for you, bro. You how dare you, Yoda, tell me that the force isn't real. How dare you? How dare you, good sir? That triggered me. He triggered me. When Hal Putoff said he didn't know about this technology, I got triggered, chat. I got triggered. So let me see what we got here. We're going to come back to that in a second. The next thing I want to show real quick is this. Uh, shout out to JK Philly fan. JK Philly fan is like my secret right-hand man who stays in the shadows, but knows probably more about this science than maybe even more than I know, frankly. And J.K. Philly fan said, hey, should we look at this paper here again? This one about, let's just read it. Proof that zero point fluctuations of bound deuterons in a supersaturated palladium lattice provide sufficient line broadening to permit low energy resonant penetration of the Coulomb barrier to cold aneutronic fusion. Okay. Holy crap. So this paper, this is actually related to the cold fusion experiments from 1989. But I mean, listen to the words that we're just saying. They basically just said, we can explain why cold fusion works in the context of zero point energy. And I went, uh, okay, that's, that's amazing. How? Now here's the downside. This is talking about the experiment that they did in cold fusion in 1980, Pons and Fleischmann, they took water, deuterium, heavy water, and they put metal palladium rods in there. Okay. And the idea was that the hydrogen would get trapped in the lattice structure, trapped in the lattice structure of the metal, of the palladium, and then they pulse or they, they run a current through it. And when you run a current through it, you force the hydrogen molecules to move, forces them to move. And when they move, they fuse, fusion. 
And when we're doing this, we're doing this at low temperatures. We're not doing this at the temperatures of the sun. We're literally doing this in a tub of water. <laughs> it's like room temperature water. And you just pulse a current through it. And now you force it to move and you get this fusion to happen. This paper is saying, how is that possible? How is that possible? And essentially what it's saying is it's abusing the uncertainty principle. It's abusing the uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics. So that same pendulum that's swinging, remember our conversation with Salvatore Pais when we talked about superconductivity. How do you get superconductivity to work? He said, we can take our, our uh, wire coated with a thin layer of metal and we vibrate it. We just start vibrating it like this. Vibrate it, pulse a current through it so that it forces the objects to move. And now you're getting this superconductivity to occur. This is the same concept that's mentioned in this paper. It basically says there's certain resonant frequencies, certain resonant frequencies that will overcome the Coulomb barrier. So normally your two positively charged ions that we've got here, normally they want to pull each other apart, right? They want to they want to reject each other. This is the reason this is what we're trying to overcome in fusion. And from a classic perspective, People think that, oh, fusion can only happen if we heat it up. We've got to force these things to move really fast. And once they start moving really fast, some of them will collide. Very rarely, but some of them will collide. This is saying that, no, let's just get them to vibrate. If we get them to vibrate, they will, at certain frequencies, they will overcome the Coulomb barrier. And... We might be able to do this and get much higher reactivity as well. I mean, we might get it to happen much more frequently, much more frequently than we would otherwise expect from pure random chance. So get it to vibrate, pulse it, use a resonant frequency. So then, and you can take a look at this if you guys want, you can see here that basically what they find out is that at certain resonant frequencies, you get a huge amount of reactivity. And it looks like in this one, it's N equals 88, where you get the highest level of reactivity. So even, even if you take all the resonant frequencies, not all of them are equal. Some of them are much more likely to cause reactions than others. Why is this so big? Because we, when you're thinking about fusion, it's not just a matter of causing your ions to collide. You want them to collide very, very, very often. The reactivity cross-section, I think is what they call it. So not only is it about finding the resonant frequency, it's about finding the resonant frequency that's the most efficient resonant frequency. And this is the part where I don't want to go too deep into this because I think we're literally, at this point, starting to help our adversaries build fusion bombs. Because <laughs> this is what they did when they figured out the hydrogen bomb, guys. This is what they did when they figured out the hydrogen bomb, is that they figured out zero-point energy, they figured out this resonant frequency capability. And this is why they covered up cold fusion. They had to cover up cold fusion because they didn't want people to figure this out because it leads to producing weapons of mass destruction. Because it's not hard to produce this. Once you realize, oh, I just have to vibrate things. That's all I got to do. Now I can get fusion to happen at low temperatures. And, and why is fusion important? Because now we have basically an unlimited source of energy. We only need this tiny little amount of actual mass or matter, and we can get this huge amount of energy from it now. AI can't tell you the secrets of the universe, but AI is a really, really good database. So what I wanted the AI to do is go ahead and cross-reference the idea of fusion, specifically lithium a neutronic fusion, with wormholes. And say, hey, is there any connection between these concepts in the literature? Because what I'm telling you here is how I think they hit it. I think that they're using fusion and plasma as the source of that huge amount of energy we need. Use that huge energy to squeeze the vacuum. And now you get the negative energy that you need. Boom.